Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Subscriptions for Authors podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about 10 mistakes authors make when marketing their books. But if you've listened to like any other podcast on marketing, there's plenty of great ones, but we want to dive deeper and share a different perspective than you've probably heard elsewhere. You're going to get a lot of interesting advice, a lot of actionable things you could do for your business, and hopefully we can all move one step forward to making our dreams come true of being full-time authors. And if you are a full-time author, let's make some more money. Now, before we officially get into the 10 mistakes that authors make when marketing their books, I just wanted to pop in from the future. Hello, I'm editing this podcast episode currently, and I realized that we didn't explicitly talk about subscriptions in the introduction. And this is where I wanted to say that we're so thankful that you're here for the Subscriptions for Authors podcast, that you're in our community, and that is the main focus of our podcast. And in this episode, although we didn't necessarily like brand it that way, we get deep in subscriptions. We do talk about specific strategies people can use, but we also want to create this podcast so that authors can use this to broadly promote their books because we know that almost no authors just make money using subscriptions and plenty of authors don't yet use subscriptions. So this is hopefully meant for a broader audience of any indie authors. And a lot of the podcasts that we are creating, we hope will be something that's innovative and on the cutting edge that indie authors can use to apply to their business no matter what they do because we want to help all indie authors explore this new wave of the creator economy and how they can make more money and subscriptions are we think a huge part of it and it's what we're focused on in our community and it's what we mostly focus on in this podcast so i just want to come here and say this at the end of the podcast we'll talk a little bit more about our vision this is only our second episode so thank you for being here on the action now This first one, we have 10 mistakes. First mistake, oftentimes authors over index on performance marketing instead of brand marketing. Now that sounds like a bunch of jargon, but I'll first break down what brand and performance marketing are. And then me and Amelia will kind of just discuss it. Brand marketing is like when you see McDonald's commercial on television, they're usually not telling you go to our store, click here and buy this product. Uh, they're just trying to get you to remember McDonald's that when you're ready to consume food, you think about McDonald's first and you think about the warm smile and the happy meal and you go, I want to be happy inside. So that's, that's brand marketing, building a feeling in the consumer, not worried about a direct sale. Performance marketing is something uh, that it hasn't been new. The old school way was the guy on the street who like had the restaurant menu is like, come into the restaurant now. This deal's going on. And the modern day version of it is things like Amazon ads. You could put your book in a display ad and when customers are looking to buy books, you can be in front of them right there and have them click. Facebook ads are another good example. And we usually measure performance ads based on ROI, um, direct sales and the money comes in quickly, whereas brand marketing is much more focused on the long term. What authors mostly have focused on, at least up to this point in indie publishing, is all performance marketing. That's almost what all the conversation is about. It's how do I get more sales tomorrow? And that makes a lot of sense when we're all trying to be on the come up and get new readers. But today we want to talk about how that actually might be a mistake. When I started, it was all brand marketing. Um, I built pretty much um, just a community of readers who really just want to read my stories. And once I had like that community, I started branching out into performance marketing. Um, but it's not going as well as brand marketing does for me. I really like to create feeling around my stories and a community of readers who love reading the next chapter, love getting the next little bit of uh, my character's relationships. And when I build that relationship with a, a reader, they like to come back for more. Um, and I just like, personally, as an author who's really close to her readers, I like love seeing the reactions to things. So it kind of like goes both ways. Um, and I think people are, or authors are really shifting to brand marketing right now, especially with TikTok and BookTok exploding. Um, it's more about creating like this community or this feeling around books, which is really cool. Instead of like Facebook ads, throw this book in your face, we'll see how it goes. For you specifically, I'm curious, how did you go about initially building your community? How did that brand marketing initially go? Where did you go? Um, what tactics did you use? Because as someone in the beginning, it's um, 
when you don't have a brand yet, when you're just you sitting there? Uh, my story is probably going to be a little bit different from a lot of other authors, but I released um, on Wattpad for free my books um, before I even considered publishing. And at the end of every chapter, I would always leave like an author's note basically asking like the community of readers, like, hey, what do you think of this chapter? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Um, what do you think is going to happen next? And all these little questions, people, at, at first, nobody really responded because I didn't have a lot of readers. But over time, more and more people started responding to those questions. And then they would even like comment on other people's responses. And it just started feeling like more of a community. So that's how I personally started building or building that through brand marketing but you could do like similar things on like social media too um like asking readers like hey what would you think about this specific idea um or what about these tropes do you guys like them do you guys not like them like little things like that i took a very different approach when i was thinking about brand marketing, porn marketing, and I was just vlogging my life. So it wasn't even like directly related to writing. I, it wasn't like I was gonna like do a call to action ad in the middle of the video, like, so here's my book, everyone go buy it. It was just kind of like me and my life and getting people interested in who I was and, and my thoughts. And it was something that definitely saw more success for me from an ROI standpoint, because I was running ads and I was making more revenue when I was running Facebook ads and Amazon ads. But I was kind of realizing like, these things are expensive, everyone's doing it, and the margins are low until like I can really reach a certain scale. And I wasn't there yet and wasn't sure how I was gonna get there at that stage of my career. So I started doing YouTube and I turned off all my ads and I remember like I still made and I didn't even do any call to actions, any of my videos, I still made like five or six hundred dollars in book sales a month after. And that was pretty cool to me. And I was not even thinking about it like selling books the next month. I was thinking about like over the course of years, how can I build this relationship where these people who are so interested in me, who are part of this community, are going to be there to buy every new book I release. And I was willing to invest years into that relationship. It does take a lot of time and a lot of people, like even including myself, sometimes we get trapped in like that, like Facebook um ads, Amazon ads, like if I run this, I'll immediately see book sales. But those book sales are probably not going to be from people who love your content right off the bat. Um, they're not going to be those super fans like right right now. You'll get that sale and you might they might not buy another book from you for another like six months to a year because they might just not read it immediately. Whereas like if you like really focus on building that community, you're going to have readers who are like begging you to release your book now because they want to read it right now and they want like early access to it and all this different stuff. Um, so yeah, it's really hard to get trapped in, in performance marketing. Mistake number two is basically authors follow um, e-commerce a lot and try to make things as cheap as possible to gain those new readers. Um, which is definitely a, a marketing strategy that works well for some people. Um, but a lot of other authors really struggle um, because they're, they're focused on making things as cheap as possible and not curating those communities of super fans. Jeff Bezos, our Lord and Savior, he said, I think a couple of years ago in an interview, that the world's going to change a lot over the next 10 years, which... Definitely probably a true thing. But he also said that I know there's going to be three things that customers always want, which is the cheapest possible things, access to as much possible things, and getting them as quickly as possible. And I don't doubt that that's like in the broad space of commodities, what people want. Like I have a banana right here. And if I could get this banana for free every day and eat it, I'd be very happy to do that. Very happy to do that. And honestly, most people, if they got everything for free, would be very happy to do that. But there's a difference between commodities and stores. When we are thinking about a commodity, we look at the aisle and are like, okay, these cereals are roughly the same. This one's cheaper than that one. So I'm going to go with that one. And that's a very logical pricing decision. But at least for me, and maybe I'm, a, I might, I'm not alone in this, but also not everyone works this way. 
but many readers, when they look at books, don't really think that much about price. Like if it's $1,000, like that's a kind of insane to pay for a book. I don't have that kind of money just sitting in my bank account to just be like, oh, book. But if it's $7 versus $5, that's not a huge difference to me. If I want to read that book, I'm willing to pay two extra dollars to read that book because that book is a totally unique experience that even if it's the same genre, right, very similar tropes in that book, this author has a unique way of telling their story and a unique feeling that they give me that I just, I can't really quantify. Going um, off of subscriptions, I had that same belief that like, hey, my, my work and my art isn't valuable. Um, I don't think anyone is going to pay for it. Why would they? Like, um, I think artists or and art authors are kind of like forced to believe that at some point, like, hey, like art isn't as valuable as like a chair um, or like these like physical products that I can buy. Um, but the truth is like anybody could make like a foldable chair. Not everyone can tell like the story that you need to tell as an author or draw or paint what you need to paint or draw as an artist. Um, and so it really comes down to believing that you can um, do that and your work is valuable. And when I started to really value my writing, um, I created a subscription model and there's different, I, I had different price points for different contents. My lowest tier that people pay monthly for right now is a $3 tier and that gets, gives them pretty much all of my content, but there are more exclusive stories at higher tiers, like $5 and $10, where people, if they want to, and if they can, they can pay those higher, pay in those higher tiers to receive additional content. Um, so you're really catering to, to fans all across the board. I agree, except $3 a month uh, still, like for all the authors that I read, if I was to pay $3 a month for like the 10 or 20 authors I might read in a month, you know, we're starting to, the bank account's starting to, to yell at me. So I'm just curious, how do you also, knowing that you do have this business model, are you also pricing in different ways? Like, are you just in subscriptions? No, I'm, I, I'm like everywhere right now. <laughs> I'm also selling eBooks um, individually, which are, most of them are at $4.99. That's a great model. That's an example of how authors can cater to multiple audiences. And one example that I'll give that is kind of become standard, like lit RPG, I feel like a lot of authors are following this, is that they first put their book up for free on railroad and they serialize it for free. They eventually start to gain some people who are liking their stories. And then over time, they convert those followers into people who follow them on Patreon. And that conversion rate, from what I've heard in our subscriptions for authors, Facebook group, and also just around in whispers tends to be one reader will convert to a subscription out of about every 33 to 50 followers you get following your story and this is how it works specifically in the world web platform there's other serialization platforms like radish inkit um galatia which is owned by inkit wattpad there's, there's plenty but that's how it works there and these authors then have people who want to read those chapters that are being serialized on railroad early and they get early access on on a subscription platform and are then paying for it. And then when the book's done, when that world's done, the author takes it all up, bundles it up, puts it on Amazon. Then it no longer exists on their subscription platform because typically these authors are putting it into Kindle Unlimited. So we all know the rules of Kindle Unlimited. You can't have your books in two places. But the people still stay on the subscription platform paying them monthly for new content because the author will then begin writing a new book and those same people will want access to that story before it comes out on Amazon and also before it's serialized on Royal Road. So you have to have price points, everyone, people who want to read the full book, who want to be on Amazon, who want to read the edited version, who want the audio book, you're going to have to pay for that. And you can pay for it kind of like, at, you know, a la carte. And, and the typical price point for the genre seems to be four. Uh, 99 to like 6.99 per book and then they also have readers who could come in for free and then they have readers who are paying monthly all different price points and i think how you could think about it is that 
it's like almost like your moat. You can get the most people reading free, um, and that's great. And if you can convert a certain percentage of them to a subscription, that's great. And then you're also going to get a totally different audience who's going to come in on Amazon and read your books and probably pay for them or read them for free in Kindle Unlimited, which is super, super cool. And then if you have them going to a subscription platform for the certain percentage who are willing to pay higher, like if you have 100 readers who are paying four dollars for three books released in a year your take home for like an author after amazon's fees is going to be close to like ten dollars per reader um and you will then have i think a thousand dollars because i said a hundred readers i hope i'm doing the math right but if you get two of them just two percent to subscribe to a subscription platform and give you five dollars a month right there you just made 120 dollars doing the same thing I'm doing a lot of mental math in real time, but I think the point is that you can make money from so many different places and not have to be like, oh, well, I don't want you as a reader because, you know, I only want people who pay me this much. You can be so inclusive, but make so much more money. Like a lot of people think like, hey, I need to like put so much work into subscriptions. It's going to take away from like, all of my readers who are currently on Amazon, um, which is like, usually it's not the case. Like those, at least for me personally, a lot of my readers who um, are on my subscription platform, they're also, they also do um, buy the ebook once it's released or buy the paperback or hardback, which is really cool. Um, they definitely do not have to do that because they've read the book already. Um, but you're really just like, they're really there to support you and they really want to support you in any way that they can. Um, so what I found personally, it doesn't take away um, any readers from Amazon or any readers from Barnes and Noble or Kobo. It's just gathering your biggest fans. And well, also, yeah, when you're, when you're releasing on free, free platforms too, you're also giving people who might not have as much money, um, right now the ability to read your story um but in like five or ten years they might have money to support you kind of uh, goes into our next mistake is not getting readers before you release but something you could kind of like offset this is doing serialization through wattpad or inkit or radish royal road like we were chatting about before um, and writing to market for me personally i have dealt with this pendulum because right to market We've heard everywhere, so I, I don't want to harp on that. I think a lot of people know it. If you don't know it, please read Chris Fox's book, Right to Market. There's a lot of other people who talk about it in Facebook groups, like what is Right to Market? You can find plenty of articles in this. What I want to talk about is how you can not write to market but still find readers for your release because th that sounds like, oh, my God, a dream. But for me, I did write to market. What I did, maybe obsessively and weirdly, was paid for a cover before I wrote the book, wrote a description, put it up on Amazon, and then I ran Facebook ads to it and saw if it converted. Oh my gosh. I would freak out if I did it that way. I knew that I was going to then be able to write this book and, and make money and that there was an audience because it was hitting a specific subgenre. I was like beyond writing to market. I was literally thinking about, is there a targetable Facebook audience that I can reach with this through paid ads that I can then through paid acquisition scale up my business? It was kind of a lot. And to... Spoiler alert, I actually burnt out in the middle of writing that series because I wrote it for me and not for me. And I think as a lot of writers, like the only people I've talked to because uh, me and Amelia were like literally just in London at the self-publishing show live conference. And we, we love talking to writers. And the one thing I get from all of us basically is that like we love writing. Like we just want to write what our heart says. And, but like we know there's people out there like us. So like the idea of like writing to market is important, but like it doesn't always necessarily fit into like a neat subgenre. We want to experiment. Maybe we do something new and that doesn't necessarily work with the model of like go to the Amazon charts, see what's selling and like literally write to market. So a way around that is to go on these serialization platforms and just start writing a story and have it something that speaks to you, but only write like a chapter or two of it. And if people are starting to like it and you can see that, then it's like, oh, maybe I should finish it. And then if not, write a new story and write a new story. And then eventually like someone's gonna be like, oh wow, this is 
there, this is it. I'm, I'm into this story. And then you could finish it. And that might be a story that fits into a neat genre, but it might not fit as well into a neat genre. And that's okay because some of the best-selling books and the books that create new genres didn't really fit into one to begin with. So you can create your own market and that's just one way to do it. We'll talk about other ways to like use multimedia forms to like build audiences later. Yeah, go, kind of going off of that, I had um, a book that I was doing serialization on, on Wattpad. Um, this was a long time ago before like demon romances got really popular, but it was like about um, an incubus demon. Um, and I think the book ended up getting like 10 million reads on Wattpad and it does very well as a serial and it had a lot of fans going into um, before I started my subscription platform. Um, but that that kind of book didn't do what, like super well on Amazon. It does really well on Radish. So I would say like if you're writing something that you really, really love and it's doing well on a serial platform and then it like flops on Amazon, just try it somewhere else. Like try it putting it on Radish or a different serialization platform where you can get money from it. That's a great point too. Different readers and markets hang out in different places. Some Sometimes readers like before genres get big only exist in one place and then it comes on and then those readers are everywhere because there's just more of them. And it, it kind of plays into the fourth mistake that authors often make when marketing their books is trying to do everything at once instead of focusing on building flywheels. So what is a flywheel? Kind of sounds fun, like a kite you put out and it, like could get taken off into the sky. I don't know. It's like what I think of when I think of it, but the boring technical marketing term that's actually really useful if you can build one of these is a loop that on autopilot generates cold leads and those cold leads could go through a sales process where they eventually become warm leads than paying customers of your company. So that's like how corporate America thinks about it. How can authors think about it? Well, you all have a flywheel when it comes to word of mouth and it is the most powerful flywheel we have by far. If you get a reader to just talk about your book to someone else, that person buys the book because they trust them, reads the book, and then tells someone else because they loved it. I mean, that is like the dream, right? And we then have to think about, well, how do we find these people who just want to talk about our books? And I'll give one piece of advice that's not typical advice, and then I'll let Amelia jump off. But the, the not typical advice that I would give is actually something that Susie Quinn gave in a presentation at the self-publishing show live. And I'm totally taking advice from the people, but when I do that, I'm going to share who it is and where I found it. And this was a really interesting piece of advice from her, where she said that you can write to a genre that has a proven audience, or you can write to a community. And that actually really spoke to me. Because a book like Eat, Pray, Love, that was a huge book. And that was written to single women in their 30s or late 20s and their 30s. And, and that's really powerful. And that means that every woman who has a friend, which I mean, you could see how like if I'm a woman in my, my 30s who is single, I probably have a friend who's in her 30s who's also single. So it's very easy to kind of share through there because there's this built-in community that isn't necessarily like a typical reader community, but it's very powerful. And that became a mega best-selling book. And that brings us to mistake number five that indie authors make when marketing their books, which is not taking advantage of network effects. Once you like have this community built, um, it's really important to like have language or story network effects built within the story or the series that you're you're promoting. Um, and that includes like really having really awesome titles that are on brands or on genre or even like on community um, as we were, we were chatting about. Um, and personally, I found that this is really, really helpful when you're doing serialization because a lot of readers, at least in romance, they like to know what they're getting into before they start. So like I'll, I'll give an example from my own writing. My first book that I released was called Submitting to the Alpha. Um, 
very high, highly spicy, um, but the story is really spicy and it's about a uh, werewolf alpha. Um, so readers pretty much know exactly what they're getting into. Um, and the story itself is one of my best selling um, on all different platforms. So on free websites, on Amazon, and on serialized websites like Patreon and Radish. Building that word of mouth through your marketing. Um, one example that I know from a romance book, I haven't read this personally, but everyone knows in the romance community what the the little dialogue phrase, we love rainy days, don't we baby, by Kate Stewart means. And it just like provokes um, or evokes this like really amazing, like sad feeling in a lot of romance um, readers. That's really, really cool. And that, that plays into two anecdotes I wanna share. One to like very much solidify this example and every author wishes they could become the, the next line when I say best-selling series, what do you think about? And I would say a plurality of people would think about Harry Potter. A lot of people think about Harry Potter. So then when you talk about best-selling books, you talk about Harry Potter, which gives Harry Potter more visibility and gives it more sales, essentially. And this is why, and people like Joe Solari, who is incredible, also has a podcast, author business podcast, I believe, or it's Mind Your Author Business. But anyways, it's great. Joe Solari's an awesome dude. And he talks about... Um, this concept of cumulative advantage that authors have. And this is po really powerful in any business, but especially in what we do because of story network effects. When you become known in a community of readers for what you do, when readers start to talk about what they like to read, you become the first person they talk about, not because they love you the most, that can be part of the reason, that's a super fan, but even the more uh, fans, but not supers, so just fans they will still mention you when talking about you because they figure the other person knows you because you're already popular. And so it just perpetuates itself. It's like, it, it is kind of unfair to smaller authors. I, I To me, it's a little bit discouraging. So like, no one's gonna mention my book when someone talks about bestselling because J.K. Rowling's already there. But how you have to think about it is that, first of all, you don't need a billion dollars. That's how much money she's made, way more than that. And that's great, but you just wanna make a living. You just wanna reach new readers. So you can kind of reverse engineer it and think about what community am I not broken into yet that I can kind of become the thing that they talk about. And for us, we've thought about that when actually building Ream, which if that doesn't make any sense, what we're doing is building a subscription platform for authors by authors. And we're super excited about it. And it's something we hope can help a lot of authors connect their readers and make more money. And we were really thinking about, so Ream, who is this community for? And how do we have like the word Ream become something that means something in our community? Our sixth mistake that authors often make when marketing their books is when we all jump on tactics that other authors do. I'll give an example that we probably all know, which is Facebook ads. It's something that in the beginning when Mark Dawson was doing it, um, he was able to scale to basically zero to $40,000 a month in ebook sales very, very quickly in a span of like six months. He's documented this way more like openly and thoroughly in his Facebook groups and podcasts and super, super inspiring. But for an author to do that today off of Facebook ads alone would be very difficult. Now, people can always strike a chord with a story. That's like the beautiful thing about what we do. But when it actually comes to like a marketing tactic and reaching people, Facebook's significantly more expensive and significantly more saturated with books. So now then let's think about TikTok. That seems to be the new wave, but is it really? Like there's already 55 billion views on the hashtag book talk, which means there's a big audience there. Just like Facebook, there's still opportunity. But is that really the best place to break in now? Is that really the green open pasture? It's open for debate. But if you wanna focus on one thing and one thing only, I think it can be interesting to do something that's working but not where they're doing it. Here's an example. We know that readers love short form video content, but I would suggest BookTube. YouTube's a massive platform. They need short form video to work. There's a huge book community on there, and there's very little authors that I know of creating bookish content in short form. I, I see a lot of um, people who are doing 
make creating like these short form videos on TikTok, but also like utilizing them everywhere, um, including Instagram. And some people are doing really, really well on Instagram, like more like better than they are on TikTok. Like some of the videos just take off, um, which is really cool. So like you can you could do both. Like you could you should definitely like um, dip your toes in TikTok if you haven't yet, um, just to see how it is and see how um, well you could do there. But you can also repurpose those videos for other um, other places as well. Like even stick some in your newsletter, um, just to have you ha you have all this content that you're creating for TikTok um, if you are using TikTok. But you can use it elsewhere as well. Yeah, and another idea, and these are all just ideas, but paid advertising is something that you know, really was done effectively on Facebook, and that still is. But a maybe more open pasture can actually be people who are doing well on Book Talk. These creators have audiences who want to follow them and receive book recommendations for them. A lot of these people are open to sponsorships, and a lot of traditional publishers have moved into sponsoring these people. Many authors have as well. But that could also be an opportunity for you, especially if you're looking to actually spend some money in marketing. If creating short form videos is not something you're passionate about, but you want to reach that audience, it can be a way to to reach them and to garner new readers and not something that, at least to my knowledge, many authors have jumped on yet. Well, I haven't even thought about that. Um, that's really interesting. I'll have to take a look. Maybe I'll jump on that next. <laughs> Who knows? That would be really interesting and we are always working on interesting new ways to help authors get their books discovered. I'll leave it at that. The seventh mistake that authors typically make when marketing their books is not focusing on sustainability and not hyper-focusing on their product, aka reducing reader churn, which that's a, a weird way to describe what happens when a reader stops reading. Read-through rate, we all talk about it's for those who don't know, very simply, how many people who read book one in a series will go on to read book two, then book three, then book four, and book five. And for obvious reasons, a higher read through rate is a good thing when it comes to anything you do, because a new reader will be worth more money. You can spend more money to do it, even if it's not like paid acquisition, just doing something, your time's worth more to be doing marketing. So it's a very good thing to have a high read through rate. But that churn, when someone actually leaves, and stops reading. A lot of times we don't necessarily hyper focus on that in the way we should. And I think if we focus on building sustainable marketing systems, you don't have to blow up and do it all at once and get super stressed out, but just do one thing and see if it works and see if the readers are reading. Something very simple, slow and measured approach is something that I don't see a ton ton. And I think it's a mistake that sometimes authors make. I actually do something similar that's, um, you know, so basically I'll, I'll just explain it. Um, every week I have um, a short story that I release on my subscription. Um, and when I'm ready to start a new story, start writing like a complete novel, I will have my readers basically vote on their favorite story that they liked out of all this collection of short stories. It might be like 10 or so. And from that, I will start writing the story that they want to see. So it's basically like taking the story that I know is going to do well and writing it for my small little market, uh, my small community. And then from there, releasing it to a larger community um, of readers who are similar to mine. I love that. I think that really too, as well, kind of does that Pixar model of storytelling, which if no one studied the Pixar model of storytelling, it's something I really recommend. Um, many people know Steve Jobs started Pixar and um, you know he's someone that is idolized a lot and I won't go on any sort of fanboy train, but I will say that I really do appreciate how he approached building products. And he took a very similar s approach from software and hardware that he used with Apple to then building stories at Pixar, which would seem very different. And I think there's many differences. So there are. But one thing that's similar is if you can get a group of a thousand people in a room liking it and giving you feedback, and then eventually using that data to scale up, that's it's a very good thing. And a thousand is the number that he would use at Pixar. Uh, roughly, he would 
bring people in theaters and they wouldn't even build like the actual animations yet because that's very costly and takes a lot of time. They would just have like these sketches that like you could basically do on a napkin and they would then roll it over, you know, they would have it on a television screen. Very janky, but it was still at the stage where you could see is the audience receptive to the story and they basically tell people walk out if you don't like it. Tell us what you don't like. Be very, very vocal. And they would workshop this incessantly. Like Toy Story 3, I think, took five or six years of this process of going through it. And again, this was obviously after Steve Jobs kind of had less involvement in it, but they continued the process. And then finally, it's like, we got our story. People responding to this. Now let's animate it. Now let's like really market it and make it something that tens of millions of people will see. And you can think about that way for your books too. Like, what is taking your most time and resources when building the product? And what can you do very minimally to see very early on without putting in all that time? Is this something people want? And how can I make it better before I do all that extra work? And that goes into mistake number eight, which is not clearly defining your brand for your readers. Readers aren't buying your story. They're buying like a feeling that your story invokes in them. Um, and kind of going back to what we were talking about on TikTok um, and book talk, I, I think the reason why like page flips and book talk does so well, especially or specifically in romance is because like a lot of these videos that authors are creating are not telling the entire story. They're evoking a feeling in the audience, whether it's like, a, like oh, this is like really sexy. I want to read this scene. Um, or like, wow, this is like heartbreaking. Like I want to like cry my eyes out. Um, so yeah, I think that's the reason why book talk specifically is doing great with like these videos. Um, but you can also see this in like Spotify, like people, authors are making like Spotify playlists to like, immerse yourself into like that world through music or like Pinterest boards where you could like scroll through all the pictures and be like, wow, like this is the exact feeling I, I get while reading this specific story, which is really, really cool. I think it's incredible. It's what it's really about at the end of the day, because readers aren't going to necessarily think about you in the context of genre. They're not going to be like, oh, she's like, and enemies to lover author. They're not gonna necessarily think about it like in the sense of even tropes. Like that might be what brings them in, but at the end of the day, there's something bigger about your brand that someone stands for. And this is something that a lot of really big companies use very, very effectively in terms of aligning values with purchasing. And an example is Black Rifle Coffee. People may be familiar with it. It's a very, very conservative, like focused on freedom coffee company and i don't necessarily think they make better coffee than like like your average co i think a lot of it's just the same coffee right so it's just another coffee but they've built a, a multi-nine figure business a year which is insane mostly focused in texas um selling coffee and merch it's like a lifestyle brand now because people want to buy black rifle coffee merch and it's just because they've aligned their values super well in their messaging and marketing and they haven't like they don't, they're not building worlds and stories that actually make people feel this. They're just doing some marketing tricks and making their company feel that way. And people just want to buy their coffee that much. So imagine like what that power actually is like when translated to story. Like when you have that awareness of this is what I want to give my field reader. Like, like it's insane. It, it doesn't even, it, it's, it's insane. And then you, you can think about like, wait, wait. So Black Rifle Coffee Company aligned tons of people who are interested in freedom and brought them together and now they're willing to buy coffee and merch and like like to be honest like who really needs the merch like you know what i mean but like they, they want to buy it so that's good i guess like for the company and as an author you can think about it this way too like what values am i bringing people together around that's what my community is gonna be centered around and what other things can i give them that make them feel closer to me and my brand. A story is a part of it, a very important part, but you're literally building a world that has limitless merchandising and product opportunities. So don't forget that. Don't don't get bogged down on that, especially in the beginning, but don't forget that. And there's people like Galaxy Edge, uh, the two authors, Jason Anspach, and I'm forgetting the other author. I apologize. Um, 
but incredible guys. They make more money off their merch than they do selling science fiction novels. And I don't think they'll be alone as more and more authors really get in to building those kinds of businesses. So we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that later down the line, but aligning that, aligning your feeling that you're giving someone with your story, that's, that's how we build a hundred mini Disney's. With your brand too, like going back to one of our first points is you want to build your brand through brand marketing and your brand could be like your romance author who writes like really heartbreaking stories and that's what your readers, that's the readers you want and that's the readers who want your book. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about how central romance is to our lives, like, and this isn't like news to anyone, like, especially romance authors out there, but I can just myself thinking about it now, like, you know, who's writing for like people who are having like second marriages, like that's so many people are entering second marriages, divorce, like, and these things are all like, again, so many books have been written about it. But if you can have that awareness of like, I really want to build a community of people who've been through divorce and felt that heartbreak and pain and are now trying to pick up and find a second love. That's really powerful. And and what can be built from that? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get too crazy in terms of my business speculation and awesome things authors can do. But just imagine who that person is and how your story is just a gateway into something bigger. That's like the power of brand marketing and the power of like, really aligning your values with your readers. And mistake number nine that authors make when marketing their books is not utilizing their readers to power their community and generate more sales. Utilizing your readers and really um, focusing on your fandoms that you already have or building your fandoms um, and just a group of your super fans rather than trying to like get a little bit from everybody. Um, really curating that community of people who want every bit of your your stories um, and who will, once they read your stories, are going to like market it for you to their other fans through word of mouth. Really, really, really important. One thing you can think about as well is how can you actually give your readerships like agency in a sense to actually go out there and, and be your champion. And one example of this in a non-book world, then I'll give a book world example. In the non-book world, there's this podcast called My First Million. It's a very, very popular business podcast. And they run a podcast where people, they don't like TikTok, the guys who run the podcast. They just don't like it. They don't want to do it. But they think, well, TikTok's important. So we should have people creating it. Why don't we have our fans oh, wow. cut up our podcast into clips, post to TikTok under this hashtag, then have a contest and the one with the most views every month gets a certain amount of money. That's what they do. And it gets millions and millions and millions of views on TikTok, new people coming into their podcast, totally on autopilot. And you don't have to give away money for that kind of thing. Like you can do a contest where you say, Hey readers, I have a new book coming out and I'd love if you can share this on TikTok underneath this hashtag. And if you do that, the one with the most views, I'll give this prize to. The one that I think is the most creative, well, I'll vote in it. I'll give this prize to. It can be an hour call with you. It can be a special signed edition of your book. It can be something really cool like that. And it's just something that readers get for talking about your books, which they already want to do. But when you like give them that space, it's really, really special. That's really cool. I didn't know they did that. That's really interesting. Um, and very, uh, very different way to like grow on a platform that you might not even be on or you might not want to take any part in really interesting about tiktok specifically as well it tends to be more ephemeral than a platform like youtube or your own mailing list meaning that your reach can vary a lot and if you go to like facebook groups that like have authors specifically talking about stuff like this they will mention like wait like why are my tiktok views really down and it's because TikTok is basically like a casino lottery machine. And it's like the, it's honestly like, a, it started off as a teenager hive mind that then turned into like the world's hive mind for specific communities. But think about it that way and then think about, wait, if I have like a hundred readers all talking back and forth, like why do I need to be there? You still might want to be there. There's still a ton of opportunity for authors, but like if you get your readers talking, it could be really, really powerful and you can incentivize them to do it. You don't even have to create a contest. You could just tell your fans it would be really helpful if you shared a TikTok about my book. 
I do think it could be really fun. It's something that brings your community together if you've made it a fun event, but you don't have to. Hell, you're busy. You're writing a book a month. You've got a full-time job. you got like three kids. Just tell your readers in your mailing list, like, like high key, this would help me out. Yes. Super fans love you. They'll, they'll do the best they can to support you. I agree. I agree. And this goes into our last point, which is the 10th mistake authors make is not thinking enough about multimedia marketing. And this one, I'm going to use an example just to show you something different because I cannot come up with all the million ideas you can use to market your books or where your readers might hang out. But there's this awesome, awesome author. Her name is Victoria E. Leisky. And I really apologize if I misspelled, uh, mispronounced her last name, but all of like these links that we've kind of talked about in the chat should be in the description of the podcast. So you can find this specific post I'm referencing there, but she posted about 20 books Whew. and this is wild. She started posting her audiobooks on YouTube, which is interesting. And they're free on YouTube, free to access. But she's garnered a million views on YouTube since launching and made over $14,000 in AdSense with over 800,000 hours of watch time, which is incredible. She's making probably about $100 for every thousand people who tune in and just click and listen she is one of her videos with two hundred and eighty thousand views it's just insane and i think there's two ways you can think about utilizing this one is that you can put your first in series free up on youtube get those views get paid for it because of adsense and then convert those people into later books in the series i should mention as well she still has that first book and these books that she's putting up on youtube in audiobook retailers through Findaway and ACX. So, um, and I, I will refer you to her post down if you're interested in doing that. You can check out her post for more information. But there, there's just ways you can utilize these things that people aren't necessarily thinking about. Like, Amelia, you were mentioning earlier about like a line in book that's really like powerful and that resonates in emotion. You can post that on TikTok, on Instagram, on Facebook, anything you want to do. But utilizing music with text or with an image that gives people a feeling of your book does work no matter where it is. And a last kind of point I'll make is that artificial intelligence is making this easier. And there's programs out there already like Dolly 2 that are still in its infancy and it's just something to keep an eye on. And we'll definitely talk about more in this podcast that can take text that you put in there and create an image, which is kind of wild. And I, I see in time multimedia becoming more and more important for authors as the tools to create multimedia um, experiences for our readers become easier and easier. And I hope that too will provide less friction for more people to be reading. Um, so you could just think about different ways to, to reach your readers in that sense. Even like events, like outside events, like that's like a totally different channel. But you can be doing like a live with a few authors and all together be on a live stream talking about your books. And that can be a way to cross promote and deeply connect with your readers in a different format. Yeah. Um, I think there's even like some Bridgerton, I think is doing a Bridgerton ball experience. I, I could be wrong. I heard this like, I heard this from somebody else who probably heard it from somebody else. But I think they're doing like something. Um, where everyone who's like watched, um, they could like buy a ticket into like a, a ball basically, where they get dressed up in gowns and just like have a good time with each other. That really builds community um, and really helps market even more um, to other people who might have not watched Bridgerton before or read the books. It makes a lot of sense though. And I mean, you can think about it, uh, you know, as an author as well, like maybe, you write like live on Twitch or even TikTok, like you live stream your writing once a week and you can have your readers talk to you like while you're writing a book. Like that's pretty cool. And you could do things like that. And then being on these platforms, new people will discover you because like, wait, writers writing sci-fi book live. I want to check that out. I want to be there. Um, and you can, you can start to do really interesting things like that. And then especially in the beginning, you can think about it like if someone comes to your live stream, and they're one of your first fans, 
or potential fans. What if you named a character in your book after them? Like, like, would, like, if you were just a stranger who found this author online who happens to be interested in their books and then, like, this author is connecting with you that deeply, you're going to, like, you're going to, like, kind of love that book and want to tell people about it. So, like, that, there's just a way to use these multimedia platforms that allow you to just connect with fans different ways to very quickly build very deep relationships that people will just be like, oh, my God, this is a great person. This is a great story. And then ultimately, they'll tell the people about it. Yes. Word of mouth. That's what we love. That's that's our 10 mistakes, though, that authors make while marketing their books. We know this is a lot. Um, I think we threw a million yeah. ideas at you. The biggest thing, it always just comes down to building your community um, and building those super fans who want to talk about your book to other people um, and really want to support you in any way that they can. So yeah, keep building your audience, keep building your community. I think that's... It's lovely. The internet's under indexed on safe places for people to be. And I think that we as storytellers have an immensely valuable role to play in building these safe, awesome places for people to just feel belonging in. But my big takeaway would be most likely you listen to all this and are like buzzing with ideas. Maybe you had a notepad out. And you probably have a list of things to do. I would take that list down to just one. Think about that one thing that makes you the most excited, that you're most passionate about. And in general, when thinking about your whole career and passion as an author, I would focus on what makes you feel the most excited. What thing gets you so energized, gets you to feel so passionate about it? And and do that. And don't focus on all of the other trends, the 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 buzzwords, the tactics, the strategies, just do what you would want to see as a reader, what you would want to see your favorite author do. Treat your readers, treat yourself like you would want that person to do. And I think that's how you can build a very sustainable career and a very happy one. Because I firmly believe that outside of a really nice dopamine rush, number one on any chart is not going to be what actually makes you happy when you go to bed at night. It's going to be something else, something something greater in a sense, even if it's not greater in sales numbers. It's going to be greater in terms of your soul. And I would encourage you to pursue that. Thank you so much if you listened up to this point. This is our second podcast on the descriptions for authors. And you will notice the first two podcasts were me and Amelia. And that's changing. That's changing. We have some really cool episodes coming up. We're going to be releasing every week. Uh, when we're recording, I don't think we've picked the day of the week. We might not actually get settled into day of the week until a little bit. We want to figure out what works best for the community and all y'all. But we're going to be getting to a set day and releasing once a week. The first episode, I was absolutely blown away. Y'all like were so receptive to it. Y'all seemed to enjoy it. So many of y'all watched it. And I was just like, wow, we're on to something. And me and Amelia, we were traveling at that point um, to different writers' conferences, which we met many of y'all at. We went to... I guess respected yeah. like four different ones. I, it was a lot. Yeah, we were traveling. We were traveling most of June, and we recorded that first episode actually back in May. Which is crazy how much changed since then. So, we really want to take some time and think about the future of this podcast, how we could bring on people and give you perspectives that we don't think other writing podcasts are giving not because they aren't lovely, but because we think that we have something new and interesting to provide. So that's our goal. We're gonna start doing that. Hopefully this episode lived up to those expectations, but we have plenty of more awesome, diverse, exciting perspectives coming in from guests. We also will still do some solo episodes like this every once in a while. And if you have any, any ideas, any people you would like to see us chat with, please let us know. We'd also love to chat with you. If you have a story, if you have a struggle, let us know because we don't just wanna like, bring on successful people. We also want to bring on people who, you know, feel like they're not successful, even though I think we all are successful in our own way, but people who are really kind of in the trenches, struggling with something very specific, struggling with maybe just a whole crisis of their career. I've probably been there. I've struggled with a lot of things as an author. Amelia maybe hasn't. She's kind of a lot. I've struggled a lot. Don't let them fool you. (laughs) Together, I think we'll be able to provide some interesting insights and 
you'll just have a great time together. So thank you so much. If you're not already a part of our Facebook group, please do that because we think it'll be really cool for you. So go to Subscriptions for Authors on Facebook. We'll have it linked down in the description. Um, you can join the waitlist for Ream, which is our author subscription platform that's coming live in Q4, aka late fall. And otherwise, share this with a friend. We would love for you to share this podcast around. We want more awesome people to be part of this hive mind and do better and better things. So that's about it. Thank you for joining.